Okay, well, welcome again, everyone, this afternoon here in D.C. at the Woodrow Wilson Center. I'm Mike Spraga, the director of the Polar Initiative, and really thank you for coming out on what is a very hot day, and you maneuvered demonstrations and Ubers and taxi cabs and metros. Thank you so much for coming, and to all of those online, thank you for watching both uh, on our web stream and Facebook uh, Live. Uh, today's presentation is the seventh in a series of programs that we've done over the last month called the Month of the Arctic, semi-purposeful. We have been uh, wonderfully inundated with requests to hold meetings and events and programs here, and a portfolio emerged over the last six months, mostly uh, coming from uh, policymakers and colleagues here in town and abroad who have asked for specific programs, whether that's with the Embassy of Finland here in the U.S. or the Embassy of Norway here in the U.S., or on issues related to satellite technology or the military. All of the issues we've covered over the last month and month and a half really have been a combination between those things that we think the community needs and they've told us about, but also solicit soliciting ideas. Um, today's program is a combination of both of those, but I want to thank you, many of you, for coming and participating in a lot of our events. Uh, let's see, the, the slide at the bottom here, bottom left, um, let's see, there are several supporters uh, of this program, and I simply need to keep thanking them, because without these supporters, we do not have a program. So Ukbiakvik and Upiak Corporation from Alaska has been very, very generous to us. Agunik Corporation from Alaska, equally generous to us. GCI Telecom Company out of Alaska, very generous to us. A2A, the Alaska to Alberta Railway Corporation, very generous to us. The North Star Group, with offices here in D.C. and Alaska, good friends, partners, and very generous to us. And Arctic Today, which has been covering events and programs here and providing a really powerful microphone for all things Arctic, not just the Wilson Center, but all things Arctic. I want to thank all of them for making these programs uh, come to life, actually, as far more than just presenting a program. So today's program will focus on Greenland. And we've asked our colleague from Greenland to come here and provide some perspectives on the future of Greenland. Long been home to Inuit, the vast majority of individuals living in Greenland, it is their home. They are Inuit. They far outnumber those who are not from Greenland. They have a rich culture, a rich history, a rich tradition, and a rich identity. But Greenland has long held a unique geographic, strategic, and political position in global affairs. With the emergence of the Arctic as a high-profile region, Greenland's position in world affairs has become, in my opinion, even more important. As Greenland considers its path forward, Arctic and non-Arctic nations and stakeholders are increasingly interested in the future of Greenland. So Greenland went from home rule status and then in uh, 2009 became self-rule. This is significant over the course of 30 to 40 years from one form of government to another. And now they are on the precipice of considering their path forward, which might include self-rule to independence. This is significant anywhere on the globe, but I would argue very important to the rest of the globe because it's happening in the Arctic. At a time when we thought there was stability around the globe, we find ourselves perhaps in one of the most unstable environments over the last 70 years. So any country's actions have reactions and consequences elsewhere. That's why I think the story of Greenland is important, but more important, the story of its future uh, is something that we should all keep our eye on and be interested in. So we've asked our colleague, Inutech Holmes Olson, to come here and speak to us and give us his perspective on the future of Greenland. And after he has done so, We'll sit together and have a few questions and have a dialogue, and then I want to open it up to what I hope is a professional yet engaged and relaxed discussion with Inutech. So my colleague is the Minister Plenipotentiary and Head of Representation for Greenland in the Danish Embassy, and he represents Greenland here in Washington, D.C. He is a friend, he is a colleague, and he is somebody who represents Greenland in the most distinguished way, but is the best informed, I think, in this town to communicate Greenland's perspectives for the future. Mr. Minister. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mike, for that introduction. And it's always good to be among friends, uh, especially those from, uh, I mean, Fairbanks, Alaska. Uh, um, but the title of, I mean, the title is Perspectives on the Future of Greenland. And I think, you know, the, the word perspective is very, um, well, suitable in, in this context because, um, you know, it's quite an appropriate term when we speak about the future. Uh, as we need to have an understanding of the past in order to point to the future and where we are heading. And also realize that we are dealing with, you know, long-term prospects uh, in many ways. As Arctic issues have gained more attention in recent times, Greenland is an interesting example of a di dynamic and constantly evolving uh, scene in several ways. Um, as Mike said, you know, um, we gained home rule in 79, you know, and during the early 70s, there was a movement, a political movement, you know, uh, dissatisfaction and frustration with the way things were going uh, in Greenland. And, you know, that led to a commission on, on uh, home rule and that we gained home rule in 1979. And from there on, we began this, you know, uh, uh, journey that we've been on uh, since then of taking over responsibilities uh, from Copenhagen to Nuuk, you know, and in a, it's a capacity building exercise and process, you know, of a nation building that we started at that time. And, you know, we, we took over many areas, but it, um, through the early 2000s, um, there was discussions in and around Greenland that, you know, the Home Rule Act was kind of, you know, um, kind of becoming outdated. We wanted, you know, to build upon that and, you know, um, and gain even more autonomy than, than what the Home Rule Act of 79 um, um, you know, was written on. Um, so, so, in, uh, so Denmark and Greenland agreed in um, the early 2000s to set up a commission on, on uh, self-government. It was a joint commission based, uh, I mean, with parliament members both from Denmark as well as Greenland that worked on that. And I was involved with it for some period um, because um, um, I was uh, the deputy minister for foreign affairs at that time in Nuuk. So uh, we uh, negotiated a chapter on foreign affairs that's included in the act. I think, you know, it's important, you know, when we talk about Greenland and what it is that um, uh, Greenland st stands for and stands on to understand, you know, these political and, you know, uh, legal um, perspectives that we, that we are dealing with because there's a lot of, I mean, I mean, uh, Greenland doesn't actually, I mean, not, not necessarily captures, you know, uh, uh, headlines every other day. So um, there can be some very little real knowledge about Greenland, but also about, you know, um, um, some myths as well, you know, about China is, um, that I come into, you know, a little bit later on. So I, I want to give, you know, this kind of historic perspective to, to begin with, because so that's also built upon and what it is that we see as the future. So in 2009, you know, as it was stated, um, the Home Rule Act of 79 was replaced by the uh, Self-Rule Act of 2009. And, um, and it, I mean, it's, um, Therein, you know, the people of Greenland are a people uh, are now defined as a people pursuant to international law with the inherent right of self-determination. That's, you know, stated in the preamble. And now we could take over, you know, the field of mineral resources uh, and income therein, which um, as we did as one of the first things in 2010 that we couldn't in, in the 2000, uh, on the 79 Act. And that's very important for us because, you know, uh, um, we have a lot of potential to develop the minerals, for example, the Mineral Resources Act, because the, the economic development are closely tied to the political uh, development and aspirations that we have. So um, as one of the first things, uh, you know, that we did uh, after gaining the Self-Rule Act in 2001, 2009 was to take over that area. So we have, um, um, you know, legal and political and administrative control of, 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 of that area. As I said, there's a chapter on foreign affairs, you know, that specifies Greenland's external relations, as well as how to conduct it between Denmark and Greenland and whenever there are Greenlandic interests at stake. That it also contains provision regarding Greenland's access to independence. Um, the provision stipulates that if the people of Greenland take a decision in favor of independence, 
Negotiations are to commence between the Danish government and the government of Greenland regarding the introduction of independence for Greenland. Um, I mean, I think it's fair to say, you know, we, we're not there yet, um, but uh, it's something that we aspire to because we're going to continue this, um, um, you know, process of taking over more and more responsibilities. There's a list actually in the Act. Uh, it, it contains of 32 areas, both small as well as large, uh, that, we, uh, that are still a Danish jurisdiction. I mean, um, we're still under the Danish constitution and we will be as long as we're part of the kingdom. Uh, and as, as, as long as we part of the kingdom and the Danish constitution, we cannot take over areas, uh, full responsibility of foreign affairs, defense, uh, monetary issues, and you know the su Supreme Court uh, um, and those areas. So, um, so I mean that's you know clearly stated, but I don't think you know we have a you know definite answer of what it is that we want in in the end because. Um, for us, I mean, the principle of subsidiarity, you know, the notion of being able to take decisions in and in an off areas of importance to the people who are affected by those decisions. I mean, that's the first and foremost uh, what we are guided by and what we are focused on continuing to acquire based upon, you know, this past that we have, you know, and the history that, uh, um, that we have experienced. Um, um, I mean, especially recent history. So we're not, it's, so it's, as a, it's not so much you know, um, a set number of years that we are focusing on in this process. It is very much dependent on our political leaders' goals, ambitions, and most importantly, you know, economic abilities that we lead uh, us down this path step by step. So, and when I say economic abilities, you know, this is where we enter into a discussion uh, on economic development based upon uh, development and exploitation of our natural resources, you know, be it renewable resources or non-renewable. Um, under the, um, you know, self-ruled agreement, Greenland continues to receive an annual block grant uh, from Denmark of approximately 600 million US dollars a year. But under the agreement, the amount is now frozen to the 2009 level. This also means that, you know, we have to finance uh, um, ourselves areas of responsibilities that we take over as opposed to getting the you know, funds uh, that were spent on a particular area in the previous act uh, of 79. But, and you know, economically, fishing is, could, continues to be the most Im um, important industry, which has been the case you know, since the 1960s. And, where we are uh, and now we're in the process of diversifying uh, the economic foundation with mining, infrastructure development, uh, and uh, tourism uh, as such. So it's very necessary for, I mean, it is an uh, impediment, uh, or it's important to d diversify the economy uh, because, uh, you know, as I said, you know, 90% of our exports are, uh, and um, comes from fisheries. And that's where we enter into, you know, some, I think, important, um, but also, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, important uh, developments because uh, in many ways, you know, we are seeking, um, cooperation as well as opportunities with other countries, including China. You know, this is, uh, I know there's some uh, focus on uh, Chinese interest in the Arctic as well as in Greenland. But I also think, you know, it's, it's very necessary uh, in that respect to have, you know, th I mean, the um, um, both <laughs> real knowledge, you know, as opposed to myths, you know, because so sometimes, you know, um, you know, um, Things can get out of proportion, you know, and they're not always, you know, based on, you know, real facts. Uh, um, when it comes to, for example, the Chinese interest uh, in the Arctic, and you know, m most recently, you know, we we um, uh, there's been talk of uh, Chinese uh, that they were going to construct, you know, all the infrastructure that that we, I mean, that we are developing. I mean, that's, n that's not uh, true. I mean, we are developing the infrastructure in terms of, you know, the airport infrastructure. Uh, and we um, and um, and there's five, I think, companies you know that uh, that will bid on the contract. It's a competitive you know process. One of them is Chinese, yes, you know, but there's like Dan uh, Danish companies, a Dutch company, uh, a Canadian company also involved. So it could go to any of them. So and you know. Um, 
um, in some sense, I mean, it, it all, it's almost as, as if, you know, there's some fear mongering, you know, taking place uh, based upon, you know, loose uh, kind of facts uh, when it comes to Chinese interest in Greenland. Because, you know, we are, we've been seeking, you know, uh, opportunities uh, in China when it comes to mineral uh, exploration and exploitation uh, as well. So, uh, I mean, you know, um, I mean, I think trade and economic development, you know, goes both ways. It's something that we, we, we want to, you know, develop as well as continue to develop. And in that sense, I mean, you know, we welcome especially American, you know, interests as well. I mean, um, I think, you know, um, geographically being uh, so close to uh, the United States as well as Canada is something that we would like to see more of, you know, in terms of uh, cooperation and, and economic, uh, you know, uh, interest uh, there. So, um, you know, for, for so many, you know, centuries we've been dependent on one country and, you know, we, now we are in the process of diversifying both our relations, you know, uh, uh, in international relations, but also trade and, you know, um, economic relations. And that's, you know, gonna continue in, in the future. Uh, and um, so we welcome all those, you know, who, who, who wants to partner with us and who wants to engage with us. Um, and, you know, we, we not kind of, you know, focus on w one, one country or the other. It's, that's not, the, that's not so, so important in this process. But I'm sure we'll have a lot more to discuss. Uh, so um, I think, you know, I'll end up uh, and we can take it from there. So. Thank you. Let me move closer to me now. So I think we'll have some photos to go along with the, the Q&A. While, while Jack is setting that up, um, thank you for the, for the overview, Unitech. Um, you mentioned China several times, mm. and I know there's a sensitivity uh, in Greenland, uh, the Kingdom of Denmark, other countries, uh, other quote unquote allies, NATO, the EU. Uh, there is a sense of, um, concern with the small c about China's influence, potential influence on the, not just the infrastructure for Greenland, but also what influence that investment would bring. Uh, perhaps a, a month or so ago, we had uh, our colleagues from CNA here, mm. and they reported the investment trends in all of the Arctic, for each of the Arctic nations. And, you know, there might be some large numbers of Chinese money coming into the U.S. And, and other countries, but a percent of GDP is really small. The number that we saw for, for Greenland, which I think was proposed and not actually in place, uh, really caught the attention of the entire auditorium here because the potential investment, at least reported by CNA, would match somewhere around 11 to 12 percent of Greenland's GDP. And we, we talked about that a little bit during the, during the discussion. So can you help me set the record straight, <coughs> the, the level of current Chinese investment versus what might be proposed? Because what I hear are numbers that are offered in terms of they're actually in the economy right now <coughs> versus what could be in the economy. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for, th for, for that. I, I, I mean, uh, I've seen some numbers uh, coming out of CNA. I think the first one I saw was 188% of Greenland's GDP. GDP. Uh, at least it's gone down, you know. So, um, so um, <laughs> but let me say, I mean, I think um, one way to look at it, because, you know, uh, Greenland has only 57,000 people and a, a small economy in um, it's easy to see changes, actually. You know, cause and effect. Uh, it's easy to um, s see that, not only economically, but in many other ways. Um, so um, it's true that, you know, it, uh, therefore it's easy, you know, to see uh, if should some large amount of, you know, uh, um, for Greenland, you know, uh, amount of uh, funds come in, it will, there will be a huge, a big change. But, um, as you said, you know, it's the proposed and the potential is there. I mean, um, it's a Chinese company that has taken over a license for iron ore, but it's dormant. 
but it's, um, I mean, nothing is happening uh, in, uh, with that uh, license. Its potential is, I think, worth of 3 billion US dollars. Uh, there's some Chinese, uh, I think, um, interest in some of the mining companies that are developing some licenses. Uh, but these are um, um, like Australian and mostly Australian companies. You know, Australia and China has have their own relationship as well. So, and that's out of, kind of out of our control because it's the companies uh, who are responsible to to uh, raise funds themselves as they go, as they, you know, develop their, their projects. Um, so we're not seeing, I mean, uh, those numbers, but there are, there are potential, uh, let, I mean, let me say that. But I mean, but we're not seeing, you know, the real kind of, a, you know, mm -hmm. um, um, the real money, so to speak, uh, right now. So I think, you know, um, um, so that's why I think you know it's important to um, facts uh, as they are, um, as opposed to you know uh, um, uh, making. I mean, I, 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 I'm not going to say you know things are made up, but uh, um, I think you know hold your breath uh, for now. Uh, but um, but I mean, when it comes to mineral. Development and mineral resources. Uh, I mean, we, we cannot overlook, you know, the, chi the Chinese market and the importance of the Chinese economy in that respect. Uh, also, when it comes to uh, like rare earth processing, uh, th uh, that's where uh, you know China has um, a lot of um, competences and capabilities. Um, so, in some ways, you know, uh, I think countries around the world um, um, are also. Um, Squabbling, you know, with this uh, issue, for, exa for example, when it comes to rare earths, because rare earths are uh, um, critical when it comes to smartphones and uh, other other uh, technologies. But it's you know you cannot overcome the fact that you know it's China that dominates that uh, industry. I think there's also been concern about um, you talked about rare earths and and, and others, uh, but the idea that in Greenland is a pretty significant deposit of uranium mm -hmm. that could be developed. And I know that there have been discussions reported that the you know, Chinese are obviously interested in that. Um, wh where, do, where do those discussions stand? Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, um, one of the rare earth deposits is so big, you know, that um, there'll, there'll be uranium as a byproduct, uh, actually. I mean, in, uh, it's not an actual uranium mine, but it's a rare, rare earth mine, but, uh, but with uranium as a, by, a byproduct with significant amounts. Mm -hmm. um, and we realize, you know, uranium is an international regulated mineral. You know, um, there's conventions in place and safeguard measures and uh, what have you. And we used to have a ban, uh, but that was uh, overturned by the Greenland Parliament in, I believe, in 2014. Um, so after that, you know, uh, we began the regime building uh, process and we have uh, made agreements with Denmark because Denmark controls you know, the security and foreign uh, aspects uh, um, in that sense and also is a member of the, the UN body that regulates uh, uranium. So, uh, but we made an um, agreement to, uh, because we have, as we took over, you know, the area of competence of mineral resources, we have some division of labor. And that essentially what these agreements uh, deal with, uh, but um, that particular prospect uh, hasn't been approved. You know, they're still in the, um, I mean, they're still doing some studies, uh, both environmental, uh, I think, studies, uh, before they can hand in an application for uh, for exploitation, and they're not yet that. So there's still, I think, some time uh, to go before we see an uh, application for that. Um, Thank you. I'm going to ask a couple more questions, and then I'm going to engage the audience here on some questions, and we'll just we'll go back and forth. Uh, I obviously want to get to to the issue of um, the phasing in, the transition to, the process of independence, and perhaps forms that might look like full independence, a commonwealth, a federation, something along those lines. But it's clear from your comments here that so much. I mean, there's lots of reasons why people and countries want to be independent and, and have um, full governance over their future. But a lot of your comments were 
I think rightfully so, focused on what's what's doable, what's reality, and a lot of that is economic. Mm -hmm. right? Can we really sustain an economy for a new country, or our, con or our land as it is now, going into the future, with a significant investment continued from the Kingdom of Denmark, but that will phase down uh, as Greenland builds. So it leads me to the issue of infrastructure. We talk about this in the Arctic all the time. The Arctic, for the most part, is infrastructure poor. There are places where it's pretty rich, but there are other places that are pretty poor. Alaska, Canada, parts of Russia can keep going. So to me, a lot of this has to do, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, with the ability for Greenland to secure an infrastructure that goes beyond just a road somewhere that there's port infrastructure, there's mm -hmm. telecommunications infrastructure, there's airport infrastructure, because so much of that would drive an economy. You mentioned tourism before. So can you just share with us your thoughts and perhaps where things are uh, with Greenland's infrastructure and perhaps what plans Greenland has over the next few years to uh, expand that, including you know direct foreign investment and, and aspects like that? Mm, yeah. Um, in terms of, I mean, I think in, in some ways, you know, we are um, maybe in a, a little bit better position compared to some um, areas in Arctic uh, Canada as well as Ar Arctic Alaska is that you know we, we have a um, um, a lot of the, most of the southwest coast southwestern coast where people are concentrated uh, is ice free all year long so we have you know um, a long history of uh, of um, navigation th uh, through ships uh, all along the coasts. Uh, up and down. So, um, what now? What we are, I mean, um, focus on is to build up, build our airport infrastructure. Because uh, what we have, um, we took over some airports uh, from the the U.S. Actually, uh, uh, going back uh, um, as far as to, uh, World War Two, um, they were built, you know, for for their purposes and they served their purposes. And uh, when the Americans left, we took them over. They're not exactly located where people are living. So it's an added uh, cost and as well as added time uh, because you can't directly go to the place where you want to. And most of the air, uh, people traveling are going to Nuuk or Ilulissat, you know, uh, um, and because that's a big tourist uh, destination there. So, um, but in order to build, you know, uh, infrastructure there, you literally have to, um, you know, use a lot of dynamite to, <laughs> um, yeah, to um, to get rid of a, a small mountain, mm -hmm. uh, so to speak. Uh, so, um, so that's what we focus on uh, on right now, as we speak, actually. You know, um, and um, I think we just had elections in 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 in, um, in April, so um, um, the parliament is gonna pa is gonna. Uh, decide on an act, you know, to move forward with these. Uh, and for Greenland, it's a big investment uh, in terms of the numbers that we, uh, we have. Um, I think we're gonna, we're gonna um, fund it uh, with 2.1 billion Danish kroners, and then we're gonna seek um, maybe 40 to 50% of that, you know, uh, through, uh, um, through the international um, markets. Um, so um, we built, I mean, we have, um, we built just a brand new uh, harbor in Nuuk and we're gonna continue with some uh, harbor investments uh, in other places uh, in the future. Um, so um, infrastructure is very much necessary in order to, you know, to improve the efficiency of the way you operate economically uh, and also to, uh, to make travel, you know, and shipping, you know, cheaper and more efficient. So um, that's, um, that's one of the keys, you know, to economic development uh, as we see it. Uh, and, you know, um, and the thing is, you know, if we don't do it ourselves, nobody else will. You know, we, um, I, you know I, I listen to, you know, other wishes and uh, from uh, when you go to different Arctic events, you know, that, uh, that I mean, the, the wish for much better infrastructure is there. Uh, and um, I think the lesson that we have learned is that if we don't if we don't do it ourselves, I don't think nobody else is going to do it. 
otherwise you know or you, you you will wait you know many many years uh, until somebody re um, uh, in a southern more southern capital realize okay we need to do it uh, something now okay or soon so i just based on some other conversations we've had uh, it's not just uh, building of new airports but even expanding airports because there's a ripple effect with with tourism that you literally can't get planes into some of these runways that are smaller yeah. you have to expand them to bring in the tourists in order to build to build your economies and to take advantage of the, of the landscape uh, and then there's just basic services for 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 the citizens of of Greenland as well and we can talk about that um, in a moment you've also said many times that that Greenland is open for business mm -hmm. and I think that's been your your message here yeah that, that Greenland is open for business and be as measured as you as you need to be yeah correct yeah. Uh, why don't we Why don't we see if we take a question from the audience, and then I'll come back to uh, to some other questions I've had. Uh, we get a microphone down here on the left, Sam. Thank you. Hancock of Emerald Planet, Emerald Planet TV, and thank you for being here. But one of the questions we talked about China and many of these other uh, societies around the world, but one thing that's particularly unique about Greenland is the connection you have with indigenous peoples all over the planet. Mm -hmm. And our uh, TV program, we've been in uh, 93 countries. 60 of those have, you know, large or, you know, some indigenous populations. But yet that gives you a special footprint and outreach that many people don't even think about. And these are, you know, several thousands of nations if you look at them as independent states within like you know the 567 in the, uh, in the United States indigenous uh, nations and things like that and I'm just wondering how you feel you could leverage that because it cuts across so many different nations different cultures uh, different economies that I think it gives you a leverage that most of us can't even imagine but maybe you have thought about that within Greenland and, and mm -hmm. where you're going in your future and congratulations on all you're doing. That's <laughs> a very audacious project that you're under. And thank you for being here. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you for that um, question. Uh, it's true. I mean, we've been actually quite active uh, over the years in, uh, at the UN level, uh, especially with doing, dealing with indigenous people's rights and been part of the, the whole negotiations uh, um, on indigenous people's rights. Uh, we took 22 years, you know, uh, so... Uh, but it, and, um, I think it's fair to say that you know Greenland um, has a high is held to a high esteem among uh, a lot of indigenous peoples around the world um, because of what what it is that you know we, um, we've been um, we had achieved and you know what it is that we aspire to. Um, but um, but I think at the same time we're also very conscious you know that we don't want to you know just. Uh, um, um, copy and export what it is that we have uh, have gained uh, throughout the process because I think each uh, um, each case all around the world or even around the Arctic you know is, is special it has its special history uh, and uh, so um, you know we you know you have to be I think mindful of just you know, stuffing it down people's throats you know this is how you should do it I mean there's been um, I mean some Countries have looked at the, you know, the uh, the Danish Greenland model because it's very much, you know, based upon mutual kind of respect and negotiations, you know, uh, of um, of achieving uh, this that we have gained up until now, as opposed to, you know, very comf uh, uh, with a lot of conflict and, you know, uh, violence even. Um, so, uh, but we also, comparatively, you know, to other uh, nations, you know, have a high. Uh, standard of living um, when when you look at the comparative you know globally um, so um, yeah wherever you go you know you'll, you'll find different situations uh, in different places um, but um, I mean um, yeah but needless to say you know it's not something that you uh, that you reach you know uh, but just uh, resting on your laurels, you know, it's, it's, it's a continuous process. And we, I mean, that's something that, um, um, that we are w very well aware of. Something that struck many of us, uh, I think it's like section 20 in the self-government uh, act, it, it, it focuses on language. 
yeah. that the official language of Greenland yeah. is stated, mm -hmm. which is also stated in earlier acts, but also there was this discussion about the, the teaching of and fluency of, of Danish. But, but in the, the newer act, it pretty much highlights the fact that the official language of Greenland is, and there's, there's a, a continued, these are, these are my words, a continued theme that runs through decades of discussion with, with the Kingdom of Denmark, where, the, where the, the idea of language it carries out through many of these official documents. Yeah. Why so? Well, I think, um, I mean, uh, if, you look, if you go back historically, you know, uh, the, um, um, it, it was actually a Moravian, I think, missionary who developed the writing system, the Greenlandic uh, uh, writing and grammar based upon, you know, the, uh, the oral, tr um, um, after he learned um, Greenlandic. And that has, I mean, and from 1861, for example, we have had a Greenlandic newspaper, you know, so, and there's been, you know, a, a lot of poetry and uh, novels and produced over the, the years, and, it, you know, it's very much a part of our, our culture. So, um, I think we're lucky in that respect that we have, you know, uh, that our language is uh, well and alive, uh, comparatively to, for example, other Inuit um, in Canada as well as Alaska. Um, so, and, but, for example, I mean, we very much, for example, also look to Iceland, who are also, you know, b have a very good record of uh, keeping their language uh, alive and you know, up to date, and and um, and use you know, use in many different media's uh, because it, it's, you know, culture and language is, is is alive. It continues to develop. You know, with these, you know. Uh, in this age of you know text messages where everything is abbreviated, you know, and our words are this long, you know, so <laughs> uh, you have to get your own emojis. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but um, being able to adapt to new conditions is also therefore you know uh, precondition to keeping mm -hmm. to keeping it alive. So uh, I was going to start with this question, but but waited. But I'm going to ask now. Some have said it's a matter of when. Greenland has independence. Others have said if. So which do you think it is? Is it a matter of time? Or is there still a long road to go and it's unknown? I think, I mean, right now, if, if we t take, you know, uh, the um, situation as, as of today, you know, different political parties in Greenland have different priorities. You know, some are more know, for a faster or speedier process uh, towards that goal, as opposed to, uh, um, you know, uh, others who want to keep, maintain relations uh, with the, you know, within the Kingdom of Denmark. So, but if, we, for example, take the, I mean, the self rule Act of 2009 that I described, you know, that was put in, put out into a referendum in Greenland. 75% of, uh, of the voters, uh, of the votes approved of that. Um, while 25 percent, you know, um, was um, voted against it. Uh, so, um, so th I mean, that's a measure of, you know, uh, that the support I think uh, that we take. Uh, but um, um, also said, you know, we don't have all the answers because we might end up in a um, in a federation, for example. I mean, one of the Danish ambassadors, uh, the previous Danish ambassador to the U.S. Um, um, came out, you know, w with, a, w with an idea that maybe we should make, uh, Denmark should be comp comprised of, you know, f of a federation, you know, between the Faroe Islands, Greenland, and Denmark, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I mean, that's the first time that I think that we have heard statements like that, you know, come out from the Danish side, um, um, and, you know, Others are looking into the free association model. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, uh, as I said, you know, I think for, for us it's important the, the, the principle, principle of so subsidiarity, you know, that we take decisions, uh, that decisions that affect the people of, of Greenland should be taken by the people of Greenland. Um, so, and Therein, you know, lies, I think, a multitude of different uh, possibilities. It could be, you know, complete independence. It could be some, somehow, a, you know, maybe a federation or union. Uh, I mean, uh, we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, 
Um, I think it's too early to tell. You know, we engage. I mean, we still have a long, a somewhat long way to go because, you know, as you said, you know, we need to develop the, the economy. Um, we need to continue the process of taking over responsibilities uh, and. Throughout that process, I mean, uh, what I haven't stated is that, you know, the government also established a, a commission on the con constitution, of making a constitution. Um, I mean, and this new government um, that, um, um, I mean, f from the elections in April, uh, they made a new coalition, and uh, one of the ministers uh, that's responsible for that area now is is looking into the mandate, you know, it might be a revised mandate and we have to, we're gonna uh, wait until the new members uh, of that commission are settled in. But th I mean, it's, um, um, so, so I mean, that's one of the, you know, those wor working areas that, uh, that also have to uh, do that job uh, and um, yeah. So it's not as clear, I've heard, and I'm gonna come back to the audience for, for some questions, but it's not as clear. About, we've, we've both been at the same conferences where you hear Greenland is going to declare independence, mm. period. But really what you're explaining here is a process. This yeah. is a question, not a statement. It's a process uh, based on not just different governments and coalition of governments, but a, an equal weighted, somewhat equal weighted, what the people of Greenland want, mm. what a governing, um, what a government wants for Greenland, and then this negotiation and continued dialogue with the Kingdom of Denmark that has been going on for a long time. So what on the face of it might look as a statement with a period, it really is an ongoing negotiation, and there isn't one clear step and then a next step. It, these are concurrent issues all going on at the same time, with, with a question mark, not a, not a, not a period. No, is, I, that a, an ac is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, it's a step-by-step -step process as we see it. Um, and, um, you know, as I, as I said it, uh, earlier, it's also, I mean, we're not, it's not so much, you know, um, um, saying that in 10, 20, 30, you know, whatever years, uh, we should attain that. It's more the process, uh, uh, but also, you know, um, I, I mean, as I said, some political parties want to see a speedier process, you know, while others don't. So. Um, it's um, it's kind of back and forth, you know, uh, and um, mm -hmm. and yeah. yeah. A question from the audience. To my right. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Brian Muelling at EPA. I um, appreciate your remarks, sir and um, appreciate the series that you're doing, Mike. Um, thank you. Thank you. You started out, sir, by, by talking about the need to take a, a long-term um, approach to considering the perspectives. Could you, I'd appreciate it if you could talk a little bit about the degree to which the, the government in Greenland on its own and in collaboration with the Kingdom of Denmark is looking at the long-term tra trajectory for, um, if you will, your, the decarbonization of mm. your economy as one component of assuring the long-term viability of the development that you pursue. I, um, we've heard here previously that Governor Walker of Alaska and his climate task force have openly said that even the state of Alaska has to commit to long-term decarbonization of the economy. And I, th I, uh, I think it'd be interesting to see um, or learn a little bit more about the degree to which you might be looking at those opportunities as part of the decisions you're making. Thank you. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, um, you know, Energy is uh, also some, s somewhat uh, connected to the economy, I mean, uh, uh, economic development, because um, we're very much aware that, um, um, that renewable, the use of renewable energy is something that needs to be developed further, even for in, you know, energy-intensive industries, because we have a lot of, for example, um, 
um, hydropower potential, uh, even for, for industries, different industries. And it's something that we um, took a very serious um, um, look at, especially when oil prices, I think uh, in 2008 or 9, you know, hit $150 a barrel. Um, and um, when you locate it in the Arctic, you know, in this kind of environment, uh, if you depend on diesel, you know, it quickly becomes very, very, you know, expensive. Um, as something that, uh, you know, um, I think the Canadian, uh, Alaskans, you know, and you know, Russians and wherever also experience. So um, we've been developing hydropower, especially in, in the larger towns. So now I think close to 70% of our electricity comes from renewable resources. And um, we have a goal, uh, the government has a goal of um, reaching 90% by 2030. Um, and even, you know, the capital of Nuuk is, uh, is looking into uh, um, how to become a, um, a um, CO2-free uh, capital um, by using, you know, electric vehicles and other kinds because Nuuk is powered by hydropower uh, for the most part. Um, so um, I think in that respect, you know, we have some promising uh, potential. Um, in terms of, uh, I mean, in terms of, yeah, um, it's, it's not a, um, we not, I mean, only pl blindly, you know, say, saying that we, we should be the poster child, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, of the world when it comes to climate change, but because we need to develop, I mean, we haven't uh, experienced some, some, uh, uh, a lot of uh, industrialization um, historically and even up to now. But so we see it as a kind of a, a duality. Uh, you know, we need to uh, keep on developing the, the renewable resources area, but we also uh, have to be open to uh, some kind of industrial, you know, um, development. For example, in the in the mining sector. So that's how we see it. You know, uh, um, uh, we don't see it as a mutually exclusive uh, uh, things. So. That that's a pretty lofty goal by 2030. For ninety percent, mm -hmm. um, but that that leads me to a to a bridging question, if you don't mind, which is, um, oil and gas development off the coast. What what are the possibilities there, opportunities, um, and how might that fit? And countries, uh, territories, they they would look to become quote unquote green, um, and and diversify their their energy regimes, uh, but it's really tempting when there's oil and gas that a country needs or a, a, a landscape needs, like my own state, to fuel the very economy that over time, as was pointed out correctly, uh, there's this kind of conundrum here where you, you're dependent on a one particular or two particular sources of income, but you know you have to transition to something that mm. makes it more feasible for your economy to be sustainable in the future and for the planet. So I guess this a two-part question. One is uh, there was lots of talk maybe a decade ago about oil and gas prospects off the coast of, of Greenland. Where might that be today? And if those resources were available, how do you do the juxtaposition between development for, for a workforce versus um, oil and gas? And I would assume that part of that, this is a really long question, part of that <laughs> uh, would also be a transition to, to green economies, right? Mm. To, to, to a different kind of economy. Yeah. I mean, the short answer to the oil <laughs> to and the gas, gas uh, to yeah, the to, the, uh, to the oil and gas uh, question is that it's almost, it, it's very much dormant when it comes to Greenland uh, these years. I mean, um, I think up until, I mean, there were some um, exploratory drillings done in 2010 and 11, and they didn't find any um, commercial quantities, but, uh, but um, traces of, um, of, uh, of oil and gas. And ever since, you know, I think Greenland and in many ways, I mean, the Arctic is um, very much dependent on the world market prices and, um, for example, for oil and gas. And because, you know, they dipped uh, so low, you know, a lot of the, most of the companies uh, that had exploratory licenses have pulled out uh, as we speak, you know. So um, the number was up to, I think, 20 or 22 at some point, but now I think that's only, uh, maybe two 
you know, who have their licenses. But we haven't given up on that yet. But I mean, but it's it, I think difficult uh, uh, to um, to say that you know uh, the future looks bright when it comes to oil and gas uh, because uh, we have to uh, <laughs> um, be realistic about it. That you know the interest isn't there now. So and whether it will return remains to be seen. Uh, but um, I mean, as I said, you know, it's not something that we have given up on. Uh, I think uh, there might be some possibilities, but we depended on you know um, the companies that that, uh, that do that. I mean, because we don't simply don't have that uh, capability or capacity. Okay. Another question, please. Yes, uh, I'm uh, John Van Aldenhorn from the Library of Congress. Uh, I wanted to uh, ask you about the. Uh, Tourism, I know that's very important for uh, for Greenland, and, and if you could just quickly update us on how that's developing, but also to say a little bit about the the sort of two-sided relationship between tourism and national identity, because mm. it cuts both ways. On the one hand, the fact that you know Greenland is a unique culture, uh, language, and so on, is an attraction for tourists as well as the natural beauty. But on the other hand, uh, cultures, uh, unique cultures that are you know have relatively small populations. Uh, are somewhat vulnerable to mass inundations of, 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 of tourists. So maybe if you could comment on, on that as well. Yeah, I mean, um, I think there is a potential for tourism development uh, from um, the numbers. I think we get around, I think it's 60, 65,000 uh, uh, now, but uh, tourists. yeah, a year. So, I mean, which is not a lot compared to Iceland, you know, which uh, gets like two but million. It's the size of your current population. Yeah, yeah. But still, you know, Iceland is 300,000 people. So, um, but that's why we, you know, we are developing the airport infrastructures, and so we can receive more um, direct routes. You know, even from North America, which uh, are not, it's not possible uh, as of today because uh, it's mostly you know Iceland and uh, Denmark, um, but as we speak. Um, but it's something that I think we have something to offer there. Uh, it's uh, it's a remarkable place. I mean. Um, in many ways, um, but I think there will always be some kind of, I think, uh, level uh, because of the limited infrastructure, and, and I'm speaking about, you know, hotel capacity and the cost of doing business, you know, in the Arctic is, is, uh, is, is sometimes, um, you know, has, has its limits um, because it's something that needs to be sustainable year round, you know, n not just, you know, on a, uh, three months basis in the high season, uh, but <coughs> the potential is there, you know, because uh, I think that's um, not only I think Greenland, but also the Arctic in in general. Um, it's it's um, um, yeah. I think the mystique, you know, uh, of Greenland uh, um, is there among many people and. Uh, Especially, you know, if you fly between Europe and North America, it's something that you fly uh, <laughs> over. Uh, and um, I mean, I mean, from even from the air, it's it's uh, quite spectacular. Um, but the, but the, yeah, but to follow up on that, the the issue of um, more tourists, even if they're concentrated, eventually they're going to want to see the rest of this amazing landscape. Mm. So, is there a recognition, or would there be? Are, um, would there be likely mechanisms to govern the way in which tourism is built, some rules and regulations so that there's engagement from local communities if they want to have tourists and if they do, who gets to build that infrastructure, who gets to profit from it, and how much of the culture is impacted by it? Because yeah. it, it is a balance that we see yeah. all, around the, all yeah. around the planet. Absolutely. You know, if you don't involve, you know, the people who live there, you know, you're not going to uh, have a sustainable, I think, uh, tourism and, and I think that goes for any kind of development. You know, if you if you if the the people who, who are going to be affected by this you know, are not involved in this you know decision making process and as well as uh, uh, reaping the benefits, uh, uh, you know, it's not. Um, I mean, it's a dead end, uh, uh, so to speak. Uh, so um, I think you know it will be developed as we go along. You know, um, as um, um, People, uh, I think, I mean, if, if you look at, you know, some places, um, um, I think it's like uh, 
there's some town uh, or cities in in Europe in Italy, you know, that are so fed up, you know, with tourists that they are, you know, reach, uh, saying that it, will, it should be limited. We not, we far from that yet, you know, but <laughs> maybe you will. <laughs> You'd like to be in that place. <laughs> maybe, <yeah. laughs> Push back a little bit. Okay. How about another question? Because I have a whole list of them, but I don't want to dominate this. But I'm happy to do so. <laughs> so let me let me ask another question. Uh, we've got probably 15 minutes or so more to go. Uh, in terms of the economy, the future to me, the picture that I see for the future economy, and this is a question, so I'm going to ask you to correct me when I go from fact to fiction here. Uh, fisheries will play a strong role. Mm -hmm. um, selected mining as commodity prices and, and global economies demand. Uh, there could be uh, tourism uh, to some degree, but it would play into that pie chart that one would put up when you show how your economy is, is based and where your, your money comes and goes. Uh, the fourth might be uh, related to your strategic position with shipping. And here I'm thinking that when you think about what Iceland has done with I'm Skip, and its connection in ports to the Scandinavian countries, the Northern Sea Route, and now the Port of Maine, which actually is engaging in Arctic commerce, mm. quite substantially, actually. Uh, that could be a part of an equation with a potential larger port in Nuuk. And then the fifth might be, and, and then I want to get your answer and then ask a, a security question, is the national security equation. And Greenland is very strategic when it comes to security issues for mm. the United States, for Canada, for NATO, for the alliances. And so all of the, those five pieces that I just riffed off here, and I'm sure there's more, seem to me to be a large component of where Greenland's economy could sustain itself. Um, and if I've misstated any of that, correct me. And if there are others, please add to it. No, I, I think, I mean, when it comes to shipping, for example, I mean, the, our shipping uh, company, Royal Arctic Line, has formed a joint venture with, with the I'm skip. Um, so, you know, as a, uh, before it was only one port in Denmark that, you know, we got to, uh, that we, the import and export was done through. Now, you know, we're going to open up uh, and be open, you know, to a number of uh, different markets. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, the, the way to go um, um, in the future. So, and on that list, you know, I think, you know, the potential for hydropower development okay. is also one of the, that we are looking into or we, and will continue to look into. Uh, but it, it's true that I think from a national strategic perspective, uh, Greenland ha plays a buffer zone, especially when it comes to mainland U.S. Uh, uh, um, defense interest. Um, and that will continue to be so. Um, um, and. I think that's why you know it's it's important to, to uh, both for Greenland to be here in this in this uh, in DC, but also in, in and around the US. Uh, but also, I think you know we should the US should cons consider uh, Senator Mikowski's proposal for for a consulate in in Nuuk because um, um, it's not going to I think the the importance of Greenland is not going to lessen or uh, uh, diminish uh, in the future, and we're going to continue to build you know. Um, um, and f I mean, yeah, force the, uh, our relations uh, with our North American neighbors because, as, as, you know, as I said, you know, Greenland is part of the North American continent, uh, not only geographically but also ethnically and linguistically. Um, so, um, so, and it's something that we w that we want to see. Uh, and I think it's important, you know, to be present, physically present, you know, in places that has importance uh, to both to convey, but also to be able to uh, talk directly, you know, with with uh, with uh, partners that uh, we have an interest uh, together with. So you think that because Senator Murkowski has said it here on this stage several times and, and other stages that she believes the United States should have a consulate mm -hmm. in Nuke. And you think that that would be a powerful statement. It's a practical statement, but also a powerful statement to others. But I mean, n not only I think a statement, but also to be there to be able to know exactly what's going on. You know, you know, we talked about, you know, all these um, um, issues that become myths, you know, when you talk, for example, about China um, and Chinese. I mean, if you had a presence in Nuke, you know, you'll be able to know exactly what it is that uh, goes on, you know, by talking to 
uh, you know, the Green Atlantic politicians and lawmakers and um, civil servants and, and, and what have you. Because it's, um, it's always, I mean, there will always be, you know, limits when you cover Greenland from <laughs> some, some post, you know, uh, in another country. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's important to be present. That's why, you know, we present here because uh, the U.S. for us, you know, plays an important role, um, has played an important role. Um, I mean, yeah, for the last uh, 70 years or so. Um. Okay, thank you. Another question? Yes, to my right. Thank you. Hi, thank you. I'm Melody Schreiber. I'm reporting for ArcticToday.com. Um, my question relates to the, the last question. Um, you mentioned that Greenland's current budget um, is dependent upon um, funding from Denmark. So as you're looking toward independence and, and the various forms that might take, are you, do you have a particular plan for transitioning away from that funding or are you just looking at strengthening the economy in general because it's so far <laughs> off <laughs> or so it might, it might take so many different forms? Thank no. you. No, I mean, um, you know, the uh, the level of support that we receive is now frozen to the 2009 level, um, and there's a actual also an agreement that um, as we begin to develop, for example, the mineral resources area or any uh, um, income that is derived from the, from therein, you know, we will. Uh, after some point, we'll have to uh, s split that with Denmark and then reduce the block grant. But we far from that, uh, you know, uh, from there yet, uh, because uh, um, I think a number of mines have to be up and running before we, we see s some kind of a significant number uh, from there. Um, so it, it's it's more of a long term, I think, plan. I mean, there's um, it's a it's a goal, you know, to develop the economy and. But we're not in a position uh, as of today to say that uh, okay, you know, in the next five years it will um, we're going to see a reduction. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about. Um, did I miss a question? Yeah. If I may, Please. Thank you, Jack. Um, just to piggyback on Mike's um, layout, fisheries, some minerals plus the hydropower add-on, tourism, shipping, and possibly security. Um, I, I, I know this is not a good analog, but in some respects, I see Greenland as, um, you know, as, as the Antarctic in terms of the science and research platform. Um, and clearly, you've got a lot of scientific work going on, and not just at Summit. Um, I was curious to know if um, that makes any dent in terms of inflows of funding for your economy now or potentially might make a dent, for example, if um, science teams who come into Greenland um, make efforts to liaise with students in a STEM sort of a capacity as a long-term investment? That's a great question. Yeah, very good point as well. And, and I'm looking to, um, yeah, uh, our NSF friend. Uh, because we <laughs> <laughs> it's always nice to have a National Science yeah. <laughs> Foundation leader uh, here with us. Yeah, because uh, I, I think economically it doesn't re really make a dent as we speak now. Uh, but um, we are in a dialogue with NSF, you know, about uh, developing a research hub um, in Nuuk, and also, I mean, we would love to see, you know, much uh, more um, cooperation uh, from the, the different universities that are engaged in Greenland. Uh, to take on, you know, if Greenlandic students have opportunities to to study here, because, you know, I was one of the few that had the um, opportunity to, you know, to um, to take my education here in the U.S. Uh, as as part of a um, government of Greenland program at that time, but that has uh, since ever since stopped. But um, we're very much interested in in having more Green Greenlandic students. Uh, 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 have the possibility to study in the U.S. I think it's a great, mm -hmm. you know, way of um, both acquiring, you know, uh, new knowledge as as well as skills, uh, and a, a different way of, you know, a problem solving uh, capacity uh, as opposed to, you know, the traditional kind of a um, more I think European style uh, that we have been um, 
not th not that there's anything wrong with that, but uh, I think you need different perspectives on um, and different experiences uh, as we go along. So, point well taken. And as the great question, uh, and as the you consider the the research uh, capacity going forward, several of us have talked about for Greenland. Greenland is kind of like a nihilism. You could create this really dynamic, needed in my opinion, research capacity in Greenland to monitor all, all sorts of issues. Yeah. So, so that leads me to, with about 10 minutes left, to another question, and that has to do with the impact of, of a changing climate. Mm. What, what has been the impact? We read a lot in the newspapers and see a lot on television. We hear a lot about the Greenland ice cap melting. Yeah. So maybe you can talk to us a little bit about the impacts of, of a changing climate on Greenland and, and some of the, really, the real challenges there, but also some of the opportunities. Yeah. No, I think, you know... Um, there's some communities all along the coast of Greenland where the only way of um, 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 of having a living is, you know, through fisheries and hunting, and especially those who are, who are in very isolated com uh, communities, uh, you know, see the effects of the, the melting um, sea ice, for example. I mean, negatively, but uh, but others, but. For some, it's a transition because um, we've seen that you know, f moving from uh, hunting to more fishing, for example, you know, in some communities, uh, as, a, as a result of the change. Uh, and uh, ha I mean, because uh, um, you have to adapt. I mean, I mean, there's uh, no debate about that. You know, uh, when you d when you deal with uh, that kind of change, and in other ways, you know, we've seen, for example, new species of fisheries mackerel coming, uh, moving uh, further up uh, uh, north and uh, entering our waters. So, you know, we've been con conducting experimental fisheries on, on, on that. So, and uh, working to become a uh, coastal state. Um, so, and, um, but, um, I mean, f f f we, I think we are aware that, you know, the, the ice cap and the continued melting of that, you know, poses some uh, threats, especially to coastal areas uh, uh, he, here on the U.S. Sh uh, shore. So, and because, I mean, um, I think there also needs to be a lot more uh, sustained, you know, observations uh, in that respect when it comes to research of the, of the ice cap. And that's, uh, I think, what we would also very much like to see, you know, these uh, sustained um, um, uh, research uh, uh, capacities uh, being built uh, uh, when it comes to monitoring of, of, for example, the ice cap, but also um, because of all this research that are being, that is being conducted also has a significant impact for us, you know, who are living off, you know, the fisheries, for example. Um, that also needs to be, I think, shared and conveyed because uh, uh, what you do, you know, in your own kind of a, a small, um, isolated kind of a, uh, study might have, you know, impact further down the stream in the ecosystem. So I think we also need to think more in, in holistically together with the research community in, in that sense. Um, and um, it's something, you know, that we are also, I think, dis in discussion with the NSF on... Uh, how to do that. Great, thank you. But one last question. In the back, please. Thank you. Well, I was one of those tourists that you mentioned, okay. which is thus my interest. And I remember when I was there, and I was on the east side, um, and got stuck in, very happily stuck, um, an extra night <laughs> because the plane couldn't land because of the uh, facilities, which I was quite pleased about. But I remember being told that it was um, while the minerals were there, and you had a beautiful slide of all these nice rubies, uh, when the minerals were there, that they were just too costly to to uh, access. So is that changing? Because you've had a, you have a nice slide up there about it, and you've mentioned the minerals, and it um, has that changed, and uh, and how is that as an opportunity? Um, uh, absolutely. Um, I, th I mean. You know, we now have this rupee and sapphire mine that are, uh, that is in operation. But I think each case is unique, and you know, you, you have, there has to be a, a business case uh, being developed as, as um, you know, that's also tied to you know different uh, prices uh, in the world uh, world mar 
market prices. Uh, but it's true that some of them, you know, are um, harder to access. Uh, but uh, the good thing about Greenland is, is, you know, it's a coastal area, so um, it's relatively uh, easier compared to, for example, um, in the Canadian Arctic, for example, you know, where you have to build uh, a lot of roads. You know, here you can access them uh, relatively easy by ship. Um, but um, I think, um, I mean, there are some pr uh, promising prospects uh, on a number of different mining uh, mining projects uh, that are uh, being developed as we speak. And um, but we need to have a, a high number of. Ex exploratory you know licenses because there's only a few that you know that mature and uh, you know that are able to uh, being developed uh, because uh, I mean that's a <laughs> meaning that also there's a high high number th that never you know materializes so so you ha need to have a high number of exploratory licenses uh, that are given out but uh, there seems to be an interest you know uh, for Greenland um, because of the yeah, both the quality as well as quantity of different minerals. Uh, because it is a well-known fact that Greenland is quite well endowed when it comes to different uh, uh, minerals. Um, that's, uh, I think, a clear fact. Well, thank you for that question. Uh, as you have experienced, there are a wide range of issues here with Greenland. Uh, and we plan to continue to cover yeah. these discussions uh, and Intech, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll uh, lead you with, with, with a statement, but uh, we've talked here about um, a transition of some governance structure for, for Greenland in the various iterations we've talked, we, we heard. Uh, there is, a, in my, my words, a global Arctic now. It's no longer just the Arctic that's on a map somewhere, not, in, not a part of the, the more global discussions on all, all matters. Uh, and we have the opening of a new ocean. And so you have change within change within change, and then the daily changes that happen in, in our lives. So to me, this idea of, of these Greenland dialogues uh, are in one way a, uh, a microcosm of what's happening around the globe, but also components of what's happening around, around the Arctic at large. Uh, and they touch us from research to, to economic development to just overall governance and uh, the way in which we were able to pay our bills each and every day. So these are no longer isolated issues, and to me this has been one Venn diagram of Greenland and transformation, a global Arctic transformation, and a new ocean and transformation. And maybe you want to just touch upon what, what we will do together here over the course of the next year or two uh, in terms of, of the relationship between the Wilson mm -hmm. Center and, and you and your colleagues. Well, yeah, thank you so much. I mean, uh, you know, thank you to the Wilson Center for um, having this, um, I think, as you say, startup uh, of the Greenland Dialogue uh, events, and you know, we would love to see. Um, um, I mean, this continuation of of the different uh, e uh, issues uh, related to Greenland being addressed. Um, you know, it can be both, I think, in a public, but uh, as well as in a private setting on a, on a number of different issues. So, um, you know, we very much look forward to the cooperation with the Wilson Center. Uh, and us on, on a number of issues uh, that, um, you know, where you have the capacity, because you have a lot of, you know, um, uh, brain power here in this house uh, that we could utilize in some way or another, as well as, you know, us sharing uh, um, some, some of the issues that we are going through and, um, and um, some of the developments that uh, we want to see. Um, so, and, you know, if possible, we would love to see, you know, the Wilson Center in Nuuk. Yes. Um, you know, so you we'll, can we'll, share. We'll be in Nuuk <laughs> at the consulate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we, we have committed, we have committed to not only these public forum over the course of the next year, two years, longer hopefully. Uh, I think these public dialogues about Greenland are very important, but they also encompass other parts of the Arctic and the world, so they will be set in context. It won't just be Greenland. And then we have also committed to, uh, where appropriate, not only the expertise that's at the Wilson Center, because there's overlapping regional and subject matter experts here, but there's experts all over town here in Washington, D.C., across the country and elsewhere, that could help inform and, and bring other, other uh, thoughts to 
all of the issues we've talked about today. So we have committed to that. We, we see this as yet one more role that the Wilson Center can play in helping to inform not just the public dialogue, but also uh, friends and colleagues in other, other countries and emerging issues uh, that could somehow benefit from uh, having the expertise or, or, and the convening power and then also the projecting power of being able to communicate what's happening, at least in our case, in the Arctic. So I want to thank you for, for coming here today, Inutech. I want to thank you for, for the friendship and for the trust in working with you. And I want to thank all of you for coming to this, this discussion. I, I certainly learned a lot. I actually took notes instead of asking just questions. Uh, but thank you all for coming. It's, it, it means a great deal to us. It also tells us that these are important issues that others have interest in. Mm -hmm. And thanks again, Unitech, for what I thought was a really monumental scope of Greenland, but also where it is that you're going. So would you please thank Unitech Home Olsen. Thank you.